Becoming a consultant is not easy. The relentless recruitment process will have you jumping through more hoops than a whippet at Crufts. Logical reasoning, numerical tests, grueling assessment days, and multiple interviews. And on top of that, McKinsey reports that it accepts only 1% of the million applicants that apply each year. Despite this, the average tenure for a consultant at a top consulting firm is just 2.7 years, with a turnover of 15 to 20%. Everybody quits. But why? I spoke to both ex-consultants and those on the brink of leaving to find out. People that I knew were looking for something more tangible, faster paced, better offers, better salaries, more operational, less ephemeral work, less rigid structures. Don't get me wrong, I am not here to scare you away from consulting, although this video alone might be enough to do that. Many people go into consulting knowing full well that they're gonna leave after a couple of years, and it can be a fantastic springboard into a sea of career opportunities. But what I wanna give you is the real deal, not the recruiter's spiel, so you can make a fully realized decision about whether a career in consulting is right for you. And if you're curious about the profession in general, then do check out my overview video, and also please like and subscribe, it really does help the channel. Right, here we go. To get to the bottom of why so many consultants leave after two to four years, we must first understand the employment structure of a consulting firm, that of a pyramid. There's a big intake at the lower level, at the graduate level and the early career level. And then as you get further up the chain, it thins out pretty quickly. This is no accident. It's a strategy that some consulting firms use known as planned attrition. The idea behind it is that they hire more bright-eyed, bushy-tailed graduates at entry level than they can promote, knowing full well that not everyone will stick it out in the long run. Employees at each level might choose to leave. They could be gently nudged out the door with attractive exit opportunities, or less attractively pushed out the door, i.e. fired. Junior consultants and analysts are less expensive to hire than senior consultants. By maintaining a larger base of junior employees, firms can keep their labor costs down. But here's the thing, as you sweat your way up the pyramid, the number of positions decreases rapidly at each successive level, creating intense competition for promotions. Many consultants are fully aware of this limited upward mobility when they sign up for the job and others find out pretty darn quick. This often leads to what I call the two-year choice. After two years at a major consulting firm, many employers recognize that you've done your time, so to speak. That is, you've built your analytical toolkit and you've proved that you can handle the pressurized environment. If you spend any less time than that, then it might be seen as a sign of flakiness or that you lack in resilience. I don't think that's really fair, but what it means is that many people will try and stick it out for at least two years. Assuming that you've gone in at an undergraduate level, after two years, some firms might expect you to get an MBA in order to progress. Some might even foot the bill, and I've linked to an article which explains which ones might. For this reason, it's often around two years that you can ask yourself, what can a three-year consultant offer that a two-year consultant can't? Should I stick it out and aim for partner, or I could move into industry or a startup or an NGO or just quit the grind altogether? It's around this time that you might start evaluating the pros and cons of the job. So you've been working your butt off for the last two years. You've built a killer skill set. You've networked with high ups. You're enjoying that sweet consulting firm brand recognition. And now it's time to reap the rewards. The exit opportunities are coming in thick and fast. At junior level, consulting salaries are very high. However, industry usually catches up by manager level. The siren song of industry calls. There's a great article by M Consulting Prep where they detail out the common industries that consultants go into and then they rank them. These range from corporate management to banking and finance, NGOs, startups. M Consulting Prep is a great website with a plethora of consulting info, so do check them out. None of my employees explicitly stated this as a reason why they wanted to leave, but I think it's implicit in any decision to move on. You leave consulting because you can. The opportunities are there for you but there is a catch. The exit opportunities are so good that they're actually a major reason why a lot of people go into the industry in the first place. And firms know this. They don't necessarily create a work environment that is conducive to long-term sustainability. They know that every year they're gonna get a fresh batch of really competitive, super energized graduates that are gonna push themselves to the limits for two years because they know that afterwards they're gonna move on. This creates a work environment that is very competitive 
highly pressurized. And this leads me on to my next topic. After two years, you're almost certainly asking yourself, is the work-life balance really for me? This is the main reason that most people I spoke to left the job. Words that I often heard were intense, relentless, stressful. I want to paint you a picture as to why it can be so pressurized. To begin with, the obvious. Consultants work very long hours. This is particularly acute at top tier firms like MBB, where you can be working from 60 to 80 hours a week, which is a lot. It's also travel intensive, very, very travel intensive, which makes it really tough to maintain a regular schedule and can put pressure on personal relationships, let alone finding the time for the gym, which trust me, you'll need because you're gonna be at your desk all day, or hobbies, or feeling the sun on your face, or really anything that's gonna develop you into that well-rounded person that you want to be in your 20s. I always found this battle between like, I actually spent five hours doing this document review, but then I know that in the budget, there's only three hours allocated. So I can't charge all of my time to that. And so then you're doing all this work outside of your working day, which is how you get crazy long hours. My working day was actually meant to be like seven hours, but you never do seven hours. Then when you are at work, it is hard work. There is an exceptional article by Medium that details this culture well. You might find projects to be oversold and understaffed. Managers can do this to try and extract as much profit as possible. Further to taking on additional responsibility, senior leaders engaging with the client will consistently add additional work outside of the agreed scope to build relationships with the clients and be a good partner. Clients can be fickle too and could flip-flop or ask for unreasonable things, but with the prospect of a near identical firm looming over your shoulder, there can be a real incentive not to lose business and to give the client what they want. So client is king. You are always pushing your client relationships. There's a scenario that one of my interviews put it that things can get really bad, which is when you have a client who's fully aware of what a top tier firm is capable of doing in a small period of time. And so they ask for the world. Then you get some managers who are yes people and they will just push you and push you and push you and push you. And it can be brutal. 100% it affected my mental health. If you got on the wrong project, it was nonstop. Like I have never worked this hard in my life. I wasn't sleeping. It was horrible. It's taking years of my life every week. For me, I felt like, you know, okay, we can work till midnight on this or that, but sometimes just felt like meaningless. Does it really matter that much what we're working on that we should be sweating it through the night? Yeah, okay, we want to win credibility, yeah. But oftentimes, you know, if it's a strategy that's barely even implemented, for goodness sake, like it was sort of... Intangible. Intangible, yeah. It is a very intangible thing to do. Consulting is the business of advising, not doing. This is what I term the problem of intangibility, which is the inability to implement the ideas that you're having and not seeing the fruits of your labor. As a consultant, you're often whisked off to a new project before you can see the results of your work on an organization. This feeling is particularly acute for those who work in strategy. It's like that stuff that people just put on their shelf and they don't even implement any of it. I was trying to think of a good way of describing this and it's it's like imagine writing like a really beautiful song that you've put loads of time and effort and heart into and then you don't even get to hear it played. You don't get to hear the sweet music let alone knowing whether it's been played correctly or even played at all. Some feel better served in an industry where they can do more, where they are linked to the outcomes of their work like starting up their own company, working in an NGO, something you know, something tangible. I always felt a little bit detached. I was wanting to work in sustainability because, you know, there was more of an impact. You're not just making a rich company richer. But actually, the work I did was a few too many steps away from actually making real impact. You're saying you could do this better. You should maybe stop doing this or whatever. But you're not necessarily then following them through to see if they actually put anything into practice. But I think there probably were other areas of sustainability that were a bit more real impact. The amount of time you spend in any job affects how far up the ranks you go. But a criticism that has been leveled at consulting is that it happens very slowly. And sometimes the time you spend at a company can be more important than the output of your work. If you're someone who's competitive, you're a mover and a shaker, you believe in meritocracy, this might make you feel held back. Promotions seem to be based more on tenure than merit. The quickest you can do it is you have to do two years. 
here and then you have to do a year here before you get promoted to this and you then you become that and then you become that in my eyes i didn't like that it meant that you didn't reward talent necessarily in the way that it should have been and i that was not to say that i thought i should automatically be at a higher place than i was but that's just not the way i want to my work or business or life to mm. unfold before me it's it's a pretty uninspiring way to do things. What's more, the further up the ranks you go into senior positions, the job role changes. It's much more about selling projects in a competitive environment, convincing people that your consultancy is the best one, as well as people managing, making sure that everyone is happy and that things are getting done. These jobs are different to what you do as an analyst, which is much more dealing with information, solving problems, looking at data. And as the job changes, it might no longer be the job that you wanted to do. When you first start consulting, you're learning lots Lots of transferable skills, transferable to pretty much any profession you want to go into. But early on, there's a lot of formalized learning like school or uni to get you up to speed quickly. You're engaging in things like project management, communication, analytical skills, and you're shipped off to diverse projects and exposed to a myriad of different industries. But after a while, things start to change. You might start to feel that there's diminishing returns in your learning. The projects start to become repetitive, the learning's much more informal, the skills you take on less foundational and more situational and consulting specific. On more managerial positions, you're often learning more to teach rather than to do, and successes become more incremental and take longer to achieve. Basically, the job really changes. And at this stage, it's common to crave industry-specific skills. A number of interviewees expressed that they found it frustrating that they weren't able to forge their own path within the industry. The politics, the bureaucracy, and the hierarchy of their consulting firms made them feel that they weren't listened to, that they lacked autonomy and voice. They weren't able to move into the areas that they were passionate about. You could just get picked out to go on any old project in any old place. More than half of the people that I knew were like agitating for a different and new project. They were like, I've just been thrown into this thing four days a week and live in a hotel. Don't really like the project. Unless you go in with a clear vision of what your expertise and interests are and how they fit in and benefit the business and this sort of agreed and understood, you are at the whim of whatever the business needs. To be honest, I think this is probably the kind of complaint you'll feel at a lot of corporate jobs where structures are rigid, but consultancies, particularly the large ones like the big four and MBB firms are certainly of that ilk. I left because at a certain point, I recognized that it was not gonna give me what I wanted in my life, in my career. I'd learned what I needed to learn. I felt that they didn't make adequate steps, concessions, decisions to make the most of my skill set going forward but also to help me reach the potential that, that I could reach. The decisions they were making didn't make sense to them and they didn't say, make sense to me. And they were also not very clearly communicated. If you feel like your ideas just hit a dead end and, and it's not explained to you why, then you have to devote your energy elsewhere, don't you? I felt un, un, unappreciated. And to be honest, that's where I left in the end. I found that a useful way of thinking about this is that most people leave after two to four years because they are both pushed and pulled at the same time. Pushed in the sense that they have complaints or difficulties associated with the job, whether that be struggling to gel with the consulting culture, whether they feel they've hit that learning plateau or that the work isn't tangible enough. I must say that the reason that was cited most frequently by my interviewees as to why people struggled with the job was the work-life balance and the pressurized nature of the work. Really, there are only so many early mornings and late nights that you can take. But as well as being pushed, they are also being pulled, pulled by the opportunities and the offers that the job has afforded them. You have that stable foundation and you've made the decision whether you opt in or out of it. It's worth mentioning that of all the people that I interviewed as part of this process, while some of them had some pretty significant frustrations with the consulting industry in general, none of them regretted going into the job, which is a pretty good stamp of approval. I'm gonna finish with a quote from an ex-MBB employee after I asked her if she would recommend a new graduate going into consulting. And please forgive the American accent. <laughs> I can't help myself. Oh, 100%. If you know what you're getting out of it, yeah, it sucks the life out of you. Like the amount of stress I've been under and the amount of lack of sleep and the potential health implications that were caused by it. If you know that going into it, it's gonna be a really 
two years in my life, but I'm gonna learn a lot and I'm gonna have a ton of exit opportunities. Yeah, it's worth it. Thank you for watching and please subscribe to the channel. It really makes a big difference.